Welcome to the Federalist Society's virtual event. Today, this afternoon, Wednesday, December 7th, we are discussing what is the future of U.S. counterintelligence and the National Counterintelligence and Security Center. My name is Jack Capizzi, and I'm an assistant director of practice groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Today, we are glad to be joined by Bill Evanina, CEO of the Evanina Group and former director of the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, and Jamil Jaffer. Adjunct Professor, National Security Institute Founder, and Director of the National Security Law and Policy Program at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. After our speakers give their opening remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for Q&A. If you do have a question, please type it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will handle the questions as we can towards the end of today's program. With that, thank you all for being with us. Jamil, the floor is yours. Well, Jack, thanks to you and to the International Law and National Security Practice Group at the Federal Society for hosting today's uh, webinar. And Bill, thanks to you for being here uh, with us today and giving us the benefits of your insights um, on the future of counterintelligence. So I think we ought to just jump right in, Bill. Tell, talk to us about what, what is counterintelligence? What does that mean? What is that discipline? Uh, what does it historically mean? And what does it mean today? Because I know there's been something of an evolution uh, in the last decade or decade and a half. Talk to us about what, what CI is and what what it means today. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jamil. And uh, thanks to the Federal Society. I want to echo your comments, Jamil. Uh, it's, it's really important that we have these dialogues and discussions amongst uh, people who have this oak mind, same mindset in terms of protecting America. So I'm humbled to be here. I'm also humbled to be your partner in this event. Um, I think it's really important to really take a look at where we are uh, in a society and a government and with a respect to uh, counterintelligence. I mean, counterintelligence literally means countering the intelligence collection of others right to you know in this case adversarial actors you know, and the big four so that so to speak and we're countering their collection hey bill With, real quick when you, when you say the big four what do you mean by the big four i'm sorry like russia china iran and then four is a combination of north korea cuba and all the other players gotcha. in the small game yeah. sorry um i think when you look at counterintelligence historically in, in our age group, we go back to the Cold War, it was spy versus spy, right? It was who could collect and recruit more spies in the other country. And when you look back at the big spy scandals uh, of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it was who got the bigger spy. And that spy got you the intelligence collection that you needed to promulgate your uh, nuclear programs, your your industrial programs, and your weapons and the DoD uh, ecosystem that has changed dramatically, uh, specifically in the last ten years. I would proffer to you, Jamil, that's really exacerbated since 2013, the onset of Xi Jinping. He has really changed uh, the definition of counterintelligence. And I go back to the Counterintelligence Enhancement Act of 2002. That was a result of. Hansen and Ames and Paul and his bunch of spies versus spies. And I would proffer you, we are no longer in that space anymore. Uh, the private sector and academia is the new battle space for our adversaries. So what do you mean? So when you say, so I get the spy versus spy, right? So the Russians have somebody at their embassy here that's trying to recruit Americans to give classified information to the Russians or the Chinese or the Iranians or North Koreans. And they're taking those secrets. They're learning about what our plans, our intentions are, what our capabilities are. Right. I get that old spy versus spy world. Right. But what do you mean that academia and the private sector are the new battlefield? I mean, why, why does anybody care what I mean? First of all, knowing what academics are doing, I mean, you just go look on the Internet and go, you know, go. I mean, the people who publish their research, like why does anybody care what academia and the private sector are doing? Why isn't it still about the old spy game? What's changed? Yeah, a great question. So for fairness, the old spy game still exists, right? We're not okay. going to kid each other. That, that is still there. But those spies that are recruited are for deeper, darker secrets. Hmm. Um, your point is as well asked, Jamil, that we have to bifurcate academia uh, and private sector. And I would throw in a third research and development. Okay. What, what we've realized since the Counterintelligence Enhancement Act, the advent of the Internet right? Has put everything online. Like you said, you can go online, you can see what people are doing. Well, in 2002, you weren't able to do that, right? So now our adversaries have identified ways to collect classified and unclassified secrets, trade secrets, proprietary information, PII, from companies, researchers, and academia via the internet. So there's two main ways they do it, cyber enabled, you know, whether it be through malware or spear phishing or through the insider threat program. Mm -hmm. 
when you look at the counterintelligence strategy and in the numbers you come out with now, I think the latest FBI numbers are $600 billion a year in economic loss, just from the country of China, the Communist Party of China, just from theft of trade secrets and proprietary data, 600 billion. A That's year? Four, a year. That is $4,000 for every American family after four, right? So you think that, does that matter? But that that 600 billion comes from the private sector mm. and academia and, and research and development loss of their theft of proprietary data so, and trade secrets. Hey, can I ask you a question about that, Bill? So, I, so okay, so I, I get conceptually the Chinese maybe are stealing intellectual property, but why are they doing this? What, what What's the benefit to them? Like, what are they gaining out of stealing American intellectual property? And how, how big a threat is it to the average American? You mentioned $4,000 a family. Like, but why should I care if a bunch of r and D's walk out the back door? Like, what does that matter to me if I'm, if I'm you know, sitting in American society? Great question. It depends on who you are. So if you are um, the CEO of Boeing, uh, mm -hmm. you should care that the yeah. Chinese are building a new Cormac uh, airplane that's going to be competitive with Boeing and Airbus in just a few years. That entire air fleet they built is was built on stolen intellectual property and trade secrets from mm -hmm. Boeing and Airbus, right? So the theft that's been occurring the last 10 years has resulted in China being able to put together an air fleet that's going to be 30 cents on a dollar from Boeing, right? That's number one. If you look at just the last five years, what General Electric has lost in their intellectual property and trade secrets from chef theft of Communist Party of China actors, the acoustical uh information for weaponry from the Department of Defense to hypersonics, all going to benefit China's military and civilian ap apparatus. So it does matter in terms of who the victim is ultimately, mm -hmm. but it's also the new way that nefarious countries are stealing secrets from the people who actually make the secrets. Let's be mm -hmm. honest, Jamil, Department of Defense is the biggest in the history of the world. They don't make anything. Right. They pay people to make it. So yeah. over time, both the Russians and Chinese got smart and said, hey, we don't need to steal this anymore from the Department of Defense. We can go to where they're making it, both in the classified realm, mm -hmm. but more importantly, in the unclassified realm. Interesting. So 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 what I hear you saying, Bill, is that there's a few reasons to be concerned about. One, secrets are walking out the back door, but they're not just coming from the government. They're coming from contractors alike who have secrets and may not be protected in the way the government is or may not be able to protect them the way the government is because there are unclassified systems and classified systems that are connected or some of the information may not be classified, but it may be really sensitive, right? So that's one problem. Sounds like another problem is, you know, we're spending um, the United States because we're an innovator and in, you know, we engage in lots of innovation. We spend hundreds of billions of dollars on innovation, on research and development to create new things. And if that's all walk out the back door to China, they're building new companies built on that without having to spend that money. And so they're saving money, able to offer products at a lower cost, and then undercutting us the marketplace. I couldn't have said any better. That's that happens every single day. You know, we, call, we used to call it the old bust out schemes, where the Communist Party of China would, you know, bid down, steal the IP and the, and the property, and then have a ghost company in China. And before everybody even knew it, or the FBI started investigating when the data was gone, they already had a patent and a con and manufacturing up and running, and they were selling that product for thirty cents and a dollar in South Asia, right? So that's yeah. been happening since Xi Jinping took power. And it's not just the CEO of Boeing, right? I mean, it's it's the line worker at the plant at the at the Boeing plant, right? Because if they if they're not building the plane anymore because the Chinese are undercutting them, those people are losing their jobs, or lose American jobs and American productivity here in the country, right? Right, and and I think it's it's really important, uh, Jamil, to think about this in terms of the vast span of where this goes. I mean, from you know the hybrid grain and steel to seeds um, to a steel that's insulated for skyscrapers to metal, medical technology, biopharma, to hypersonics, yeah. you name the platform, the Chinese have been very successful at stealing it. And in the research and development um, ecosystem you talked about just before, I, I would proffer that that is, we have the best research and development academic ecosystem in the world has ever seen, but it's yeah. built on a collaborative mindset. Yeah. And that collaborative mindset is so successful, but also avails itself to that very, very easy theft from yeah. actors who want to steal it.
Yeah, that makes all sense. And by the way, for the audience members, we are going to be taking questions from you uh, in the latter half of this uh, of this session. So please do put your questions. There's a Q and A function. You drop your questions there. We'll see them, and then we'll uh, we'll go through them and, and have Bill answer some of his questions. So, uh, so, but coming back to this idea, Bill, uh, of of IP theft and the like, and so the, the Chinese are building this economic engine based on on stolen American. Uh, R and D. Presumably, other countries are doing the same. They're also stealing secrets. That helps them. That benefits them on the national security front. Both economic security and national security are really closely tied together. So, let's say I buy your story that this is the new counterintelligence, the real problem. So, who in the government owns this problem? Like, who in the government is responsible for stopping the Chinese or any other country, for that matter, from a stealing our secrets and b stealing our economic capabilities and building a new economic engine without that investment in R and D that we're all putting in? That's a great question, and I'm pretty sure that's one of the reasons why we're here, Jamil. Let's put it in current context. The last year and a half, the legislation that the U.S. Congress has put out, from Build Back Better to the infrastructure to recently the CHIPS Act, right? Yeah. A lot, billions of dollars that Hundreds are going into yeah. the private sector, right? The president was just in Arizona this week, you know, with TSAM putting together new plants there. Yeah. I would ask you, whose responsibility is it to protect all that economic investment and the de de delivery of intellectual property and trade seekers as we build chips more effectively here. And whose job is to protect that? Nobody's like, there is no assigned. So what, is it a supply chain issue, right? Is it a research issue? Is it critical infrastructure? Now the FBI is number one in line to investigate when that stuff is stolen. You know, I would proffer to you that we don't have a definitive organization that's primary role is to prevent that educate, inform, and provide real-time intelligence to help those companies protect what they're ideating, manufacturing, and developing. Well, but Bill, but you but you ran an organization called the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, right? So I guess maybe I just assumed it was your job right back in the day. What, tell me, tell me wh where did NCSC come from, right? Uh, what does it do if it's not that? And is there something else it should be doing or, or does it need authority? Does it need money? Like what, what's the, what's the challenge? And maybe it's not their job. I don't know. I mean, you tell me. Well, first of all, those are good questions. And uh, they're a little, little, little they're, they're not softballs, Jamil. They're not softballs. I just want to put that clear. Um, so I, I think NCSC stemmed from the, the old national counterintelligence executive, right? Which mm -hmm. was created after the 2002 counterintelligence enhancement act right. to really coordinate efforts in the United States government to protect spies in the U.S. government, right, to coordinate counterintelligence operations to, A, protect from getting recruited as a spy, but also to facilitate operations overseas. It's okay. grown since then. And then in 2014, uh, the DNI made it a center, a counterintelligence security center. And it That's really the built, director of national intelligence. Yeah, sorry, director yeah. of national intelligence created it to, to, to be equal to on par with the National um, Counterterrorism Center, and National Proliferation Center. And it really was now a bastion for counterintelligence and security professionals to have the same center. It really grew out of demand, and I would say hit hard by the OPN data breach for a centralized place that really had one foot in the intelligence community and one foot in the rest of the government, the non-Title 50 organizations, research and development, to be able to bridge the gap from what we see overseas from collection to providing threat and warning to the other government agencies as well as the private sector. Uh, NCSC never really grew fast enough to be able to do that role effectively yeah. uh, among their other duties, but the other primary duties are the, the government's strategy and policy organism to drive counterintelligence security. Yeah, so you mentioned a couple of things there that were drivers to, to sort of building NCSC up, and, and one of them was this OPM data breach. What, what is that OPM? I think a lot of people may know, but what is the OPM data breach? Um, and 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 talks about why that was relevant to how uh, uh, NCSC's mission may or may not need to change. Sure. So the the OPM data breach, um, Cliff Notes version, uh, was breached by the Communist Party of China, and they were able to take um, twenty one million twenty one million human beings who applied for security clearances. They were able to exfiltrate not only their their applications for clearances, but their entire files. Right. So a couple things from that. Um, number one, they have all that data, all the secrets, all the, the things you don't want to put anywhere else. But under security clearance, they have all that availability Two, what's seldom known is that the breach occurred from a contractor who was servicing 
OPM, right? So in today's day, 20, 2022, it would be a major supply chain breach, right? Which it, which it was. And, and I would say thirdly, it was, it was really the top of mind where it was the first time we saw a nation state threat actor, the Chinese, really siphoning massive amounts of data, right, in, in the government. I th think that was the place where we looked at it in congressional hearings as to, okay, well, the FBI is going to investigate this. Yeah. Uh, well, then who else should really do a damage assessment, right? And that's where NCSC came in to be able to put together and show what this data looks like when combined with other data stolen from Marriott and Equifax and others. Yeah. So, so what I hear you saying is that there's all this data about people who had clearances, right? It's not just their, the, the form they filled out, which has all the addresses they lived at, all the people, all their relatives, all their relatives' phone numbers. But it's also the FBI goes around and does interviews with these people and here's about, okay, well, why, how might this person be vulnerable, right? What are they, they spend poor, you know, they spend in, in unwise ways. Do they, are they an alcoholic? Do they have, are they having affairs, right? Because they want to know all the things that might make you vulnerable. Well, now the Chinese have all that information. So they can run very sophisticated data analysis over that. They can also run very sophisticated human intelligence operations to target our people with clearances. And then they combine that with information from TikTok and 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 the Anthem data breach, the healthcare data breach, and and the and the and the um, uh, the breach of, uh, of credit reporting agencies. Combine all that data, and now they can train machine learning systems to predict how people might behave and how they might act based on all the data they have about them. That's pretty scary. And it is. so it is. So NCSC in part got some more authorities or or some more responsibility to deal with this. So. So does NCN does NCSC today have the responsibility for preventing that things like that from happening again? Private contractors, all this data about Americans, sensitive information out the back door of the Chinese. Is that is that NCSC's job today? Do they have the authority, the responsibility, and the money to do that job? Yeah, no, no, and no. So uh, um, uh, again, big picture, NCSC's authorities, responsibilities is to write strategy for the counterintelligence security apparatus of the United States government and okay. the private sector, write yeah. policies for counterintelligence, and then for security clearance reform. That's kind of what they do. They're okay. supposed to be doing all these other things with respect to damage assessments, right? And then mm -hmm. other things that are cure, but they're just not big enough and scalable to do that. So uh, responsibility comes from those individuals and those organizations who become breached, right? To have them a good uh, cyber hygiene, a good CISO, a good CSO, integrating with the intelligence community, getting head of the intelligence. Those are individual organizations that have to do that. Now, with the current government makeup, from a cyber perspective, one will look to CISA for that role, right? Yeah. And then the FBI after their breach. So right now, from a counterintelligence perspective, the NCSC would provide, hey, here's what the CIA and NSA are seeing from the collection that's going to help you advise your risk matrix. And that's yeah. what NCSC would deliver that. Yeah, but so Bill, I get that, but you know, one of the challenges I have with with, with sort of that scenario is, you know, in the, in the it, it goes to the private sector. Then we'll talk about the government. So you know, we've always thought about in the private sector. Listen, if a Russian bomber comes over the horizon, or or the Russians fire a, a ballistic missile at you know a city, nobody thinks, oh, you know, Target, Walmart, you know, J.P. Morgan, why didn't you guys have surface to air missiles on the roof of your building to shoot down that missile? Or, you know, or shoot down that airplane, right? Everyone, everyone thinks, oh, well, we're not going to blame those private companies, right? The government has that job of protecting the nation when it comes to foreign nation state actors, right? But in the cyber domain, it's the exact opposite. In the cyber domain, we say, no, no, no. J.P. Morgan, Walmart, Target, a mom and pop shop, you know, in Paducah, Kentucky, right? Nothing against Paducah, right? But just wherever, right? They, they're all responsible for defending against that strip kit, strip kitty in the basement, the, the criminal hacker gang, and... China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. And of course, that doesn't make any sense, right? They can't do that. And now you're saying the same thing is true in the government. The government, well, you know, NCSC does strategy, got it. FBI does investigations after the fact, got it. But there's no one that has the defend the nation mission, or maybe there is, and I just don't know who it is. I mean, who has the defend the nation mission? It's really every agency's got to figure it out for themselves. It's a great question and a perfect scenario. And I think a metaphor, I think, for the audience here that would understand this is back in 2017, 18, you know, I think we, the intelligence community came together and went to the White House NSC, and then we got the NSC and Department of Defense to stop the Open Skies Treaty. Because mm -hmm. what, we, what we identified was these Russian flights that were taking place from a treaty that was 20 years old were flying over the U.S., 
Yes, they were taking pictures of military bases, but more importantly, which is what they were allowed to do. That's what they're supposed to do. But more importantly, they were taking pictures and videos and photos of stadiums, water treatment facilities, gas and oil pipelines, petroleum pipelines. Well, that's not part of the treaty. And why would they be doing that if not for nefarious um, capabilities, right? And what we were able to do is to show, okay, this flight came over today and took a video of a petroleum facility in Houston, Texas. Well. Also, at the same time, a Russian spy was seen in and around that facility. So it was an intelligence collection in critical infrastructure, right? So it was a really that that delving out of government slash military apparatus into the intelligence collection of critical infrastructure. And, and again, back to your point, the government has a responsibility, in my mind, to advise and inform those companies that you are, have intelligence collection uh ongoing against your facilities or your business. Right. So at a minimum, one thing you might think of the government doing is, is look, okay, even if we're going to leave the responsibility with the private sector, because they've got the information, they own the systems, we're not going to really put, you know, cyber guards at the border of the U.S. internet, even if you could identify that border of the U.S. internet, which you can't, right? Um, But if you could, we're just not going to do what it takes to do that, because that would cost a lot of money, be a lot of effort. And frankly, we need a lot of surveillance. The American people probably aren't willing to accede to, right? So we're not going to do that. We're going to put it back on the companies. But at a minimum, we should tell them, hey, we're out there collecting intelligence ourselves. We got we got spies in foreign countries. We have cyber operations that we're conducting. We see there may be a potential attack against you, right? Um, and we're going to let you know, hey, here's what's happening out in foreign space. You need to be prepared. Be prepared to defend yourself. And by the way, work with, work with your colleagues in other parts of the industry to share that information and get it out there and protect one another. So I get that. I mean, is that can the government is the government architected to do that? Can they share that kind of granular classified information with the private sector at the speed and scale they need to? And, and can they really operationalize that capability? Because it seems I mean, the government, the government has a hard time sharing classified information, right? <laughs> can they really do that at scale? Is that gonna, is that going to work? Great, it's a great question. A great seg- uh, setup. The answer is yes, we can, and we do it very effectively when it comes to counterterrorism. We do it very well. And, and we have what's called a terror line, right? So you could have a really sensitive, classified piece of intelligence that says country X or, or Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab is targeting this building. And then we can give a terror line to that building and, and say, hey, listen, you're under, we need to do that type of activity from nation state okay. threat actors, because it's very simple to do once you have that the, the platform and framework in place, which I believe we do in counterterrorism. We just need to emulate that for nation state yeah. threat actors. Well, so let's talk about that. So, you know, we, we about a year and a half ago, right, we had a major, a major breach, right? The solar winds hack, right? It was targeting uh, both the government and the private sector um, and very effective. They got to the government through the private sector. Um, and apparently tons of computers, I understand it, tons of systems in the government were breached. We may not even know how many systems were breached because they did a good job hiding their tracks. They got authorized access. They may still be in the systems. We're trying to boot them all out, but we're not sure. Um, talk to us about how, it, it, let's say let's say we we were doing the thing you say, right? Let's say NCSC had all the money and the, like, the strategy policy. We figured out who operationally should do it. We put those people out there. They're working with industry hand in hand. And we fast forward, you know, five years from now and, and, and you've got all your wishes satisfied. Would we have stopped solar winds, and 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 if so, how would that have how would that have worked? Yeah, uh, good question, Jamil. I think there's two segments here. Number one, some of that you just referenced does happen ad hoc, okay. whether okay. it be from NSA or FBI. Yep. FBI has 56 field offices. They have private sector outreach coordinators that can do bits and pieces of that ad hoc, and sometimes strategically sector by sector. CISA mm-hmm. does it very well in a cyber perspective, right? Um, yeah. I would argue that most of those cyber activities are from nation state threat actors. And that's what NSA does it from time to time when it's okay. a really critical issue. But those are all ad hoc and not coordinated, right? So that's number one. Number two is I would profit to you that on the solar winds side of things, early on, if we have the right collection emphasis messages and we're able to identify uh, that code development and affairs capability overseas early, we can warn folks ahead of time if mm-hmm. we are aggressively willing to declassify what we collect on the front end of things, right? Sometimes yeah. we just aren't there yet with saying, we see something that we think three years from now can be a problem. And we we just 
declassifying it is going to cause us a potential problem for how we source and method this information. Yeah. I think we're still stuck in the government in that matrix of, hmm, I'm not sure we want to. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I've i been out for a little bit longer than you have, so I can sort of, I'll, I'll just say it, right? I mean, we live in other people's computer systems and watch stuff they're doing. So there's a real possibility that somebody's designing a hack against the United States. We might see it, right? And we might know it's coming. Then the question becomes, how do we tell American companies that we know this thing is potentially coming up against us? And here's how to protect against it without revealing to the adversary, hey, we were in your systems. We saw what was happening. We know what's going on, right? I mean, you know, so some of it is you said we got to declassify it, right? But but that's a challenge because one, the government doesn't want to give up the fact that, hey, we, we know this thing, right? Because that might reveal the source and method of the collection, right? We don't want to blow that. So in a, in, in a practical sense, Bill, how do we... How does the government make those decisions about what to declassify and what not to and when to do it? And is there a realistic way to make that faster, better, more efficient, work with the private sector so that we, in fact, do get ahead of these things? Or are we, I mean, it sounds like you might be worried that, you know, it just takes too long and we we just, we protect the information so, so well that we ultimately miss the forest for the trees and systems end up getting hacked and we have, we have potential problems in our critical infrastructure. Even though we may have even known what was going to happen, we just couldn't share it. I mean, that seems, I mean, if that happens, right, Bill, we're going to we're gonna be back in the 9-11 scenario, right? Where people are going to be a lot of retrospective people looking back and being like, you knew this thing and didn't tell anybody, right? I mean, that's going to be a real problem. I mean, is that where, is that potentially where we are? And if so, how do we get ahead of that knowing that's potentially where we are? Yeah, Jamil, it's a it's a pendulum for sure. And, and there's times where we do it very successfully uh, in the government. There's times where we maybe are a little hesitant. And there are times where we, we just can't. Or I mean, yeah, I think yeah. you look at those two buckets. Let's look recently, you know, and what the U.S. government was able to do with uh, getting information out on the invasion of Ukraine before the mm -hmm. invasion, right, to help the Ukrainians out. More importantly, to help the world out as to what we are seeing. And, you know, I would say, you know, the old adage, Dan the Torpedo, say, listen, whatever we, we're collecting it, we're going to let – uh, people know to save lives, right? right. So we can do when we want to do it. Um, and we do do it successfully right. when it's important. And who we tell the CEO, the general counsel of that particular company, we let them know. My, my concern is how to do that more macroly. If you look at what CIS and the FBI does very successfully on these joint bulletins on cyber-related events, right? Cyber-related, yeah. whether it be malware, they do it successfully. I would like to see that success happen more macroly in terms of nefarious activity of nation state threat actors in the ecosystem, say of economic espionage, malign foreign influence, or what are yeah. they trying to do on supply chain? A bigger apparatus than just the ones and zeros. Right. Okay. Well, so I guess that makes sense to me. So, so, so if we're going down this road of this real close collaboration between government and industry, right? Is there stuff that the government needs from industry to make it better and to make its collections more efficient and more effective? And how do we how do we get that information too from industry? Is that the case? And if so, like what what would the government what would be the government needs from industry through this part? Yeah, great question. And there's places and pockets where it works really well, Jamil. Yeah. I, I would proffer the financial services sector, the okay. energy sector, and to some part the telecommunications sectors really work closely with the government uh, organisms that are that are built to help them. The ISECs. Uh, that are built really do a good job of sharing that information both ways, you know, in terms of back and yeah. forth. Now, it gets really tricky when the government doesn't want to get in the knickers of those private sector companies, right? Mm -hmm. And the financial services uh, sector will share what they need to share, but they are the best collectors. And if you, if you put it in private, in the really current events, what tech yeah, companies, yeah. right? Tech companies collect more than anybody. Right. But so where's that right. sweet spot for going back and forth and having them share with the government what they know? Yeah. And, and again, the hard part there is what makes America great is that clear bifurcation between the government and the private sector. But from yeah. a threat perspective, that sharing is really, really important. And my would profit to you again, we do it very well when it comes to terrorism. Yeah. I mean, because we learned the lesson, right? We learn what happens when you don't share information. I mean, what happened, right? I mean, 9-11 might be worth reminding people the story since it's been, you know, 20 plus years since that, right? We knew that a couple of the Al-Qaeda operatives that flew those planes into those buildings on that day, we knew they were they were terrorists, right? In particular, Nawaf al-Hazmi and Khalid Midar, right? The CIA was on to them. They watched them. They, they surveilled them at a meeting in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, the CIA also knew that they had valid passports to travel to the United States. Nobody bothered to tell the FBI, which was doing an investigation uh, with respect to the USS coal bombing. In fact, there was some conversation about whether that information should be shared or whether it could be shared. 
Ultimately, Nawaf al-Hazmi and Khalid Bidar come to the U.S. in their actual names that we knew. Nawaf al-Hazmi sort of shockingly lived in San Diego, was in the phone book. If you go to the if you go to the 9-11 Museum in New York, you can see the phone book from San Diego, California, where he's there under his actual true name. And by the time we figure this out, it was too late and those planes were flying into buildings. And I mean, and so we learned that lesson in a catastrophic way, 3,000 Americans dead. We see a similar problem. It sounds like you're telling us, Bill, on the counterintelligence side when it comes to uh, these these economic and larger national security threats, right? Maybe not maybe not planes flying into buildings, but you know the economic version of that um, and the national security version of that they may they may get these secrets, right? And it doesn't sound like we're quite there. So, like you know, I know you recently testified before uh, the Senate on this issue. Uh, the Senate did, did an investigation uh, and, and issued a report. You testified about your old agency. Talk to us about some of the some of what came out in that report. Talk to us about what sort of what your views are on on what could be done differently with respect to NCSC and the larger counterintelligence effort. Like, where should we head from here? By the way, just a reminder for the audience: I do see one question already in the Q and A. Please put more questions in here in about five ten minutes. We'll turn to your your questions. So if you've got questions for me or for Bill about these issues in particular or other issues that are related, throw them in there. And we'll come over to them. So Bill, what do you think about that? I mean, what are the how should we be thinking about the larger operation of the government in your old agency and things that could be done differently or better? Yeah, Jamil. So uh, just pi- amplifying your, your statements on 9-11, and I was an FBI agent back in New Jersey at the time uh, with Flight 93. And as, as you referenced what the CIA was doing overseas, at the same time, the FBI had intelligence failures with respect to you know, these these Saudis taking flight lessons, right? So there, there, right. there, there was that, uh, I would say, by coastal, you know, Oconus Conus failure of intelligence sharing, right? And, yeah. and so, right. And in fact, Bill, I mean, if I remember correctly, there was an internal conversation about FBI about sharing information from the intelligence side to the criminal side. And somebody had shown with this amazing email that says, you know, one day, someday, because we created this wall, people are going to die, and everyone's going to look back and say, why did we, why did we share this information? And in fact, that's exactly came to pass. Right. So, um, leveraging that and everything we learned from 9 11, we're all part of that you know, uh, painfully, you know, as, as it was. My proffer to the Senate and to the Congress is that we are in a terrorism event right now. It's a slow, methodical event, mostly by the Communist Party of China, but others, right, to bleed us. And again, you mentioned the 600, I did too, is the $600 billion a year. That's a lot of money, but that's just what we know, right? That doesn't include the malign foreign influence and the legitimate economic efforts the Chinese use here in the U.S. that has nefarious capabilities. I'll bring up two, Huawei, right? You have Huawei, you have TikTok, and now you have these EPMC cranes that are all over our ports. Those are legitimate economic venues for which also have dual use capability for intelligence collection. To me, we need to be as aggressive and assertive with these issues as we are with counterterrorism, right? Yeah. But the problem is we don't feel the pain of this damage that's done, right? It's not right. something that's fungible. We don't go to memorial services. We don't have family members who die. It's very slow, methodical, I would say, bleeding of the American uh, sociological and economic ecosystems. Yeah. And I do think that we have to look at it that way as we move forward to to defend ourselves for the next five years, 10 years, and 20 years. Well, so let's talk about that. I mean, I, I do feel like, you know, the American people had a little bit of a wake-up call in the last couple of years, we went through the pandemic, right? Um, and we saw how reliant we are on China, for example, on PPE, personal protective equipment, right, masks and the like. We also found out how reliable, reliant we are on China for pharmaceutical precursors to create the vaccines we needed to. That we relied on them for a lot of this, a lot of this material. We've heard a lot of talk in the last few uh, months, in the last year, about semiconductors, right, supply chain shortages. You know, we've heard about critical minerals and how reliant we are on China for key minerals that are part of the EV transition, like cobalt and nickel. So I think the American people are starting to hear that message and that message is starting to resonate, right? And they also see the way that the China, the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party treats its own people, interning a million Muslims in, in the Xinjiang province, right? The way they treat democracy actors in Hong Kong, the threats they make against our, our friends in Taiwan, right? So I think the American people are trying to are starting to figure it out, but is it really going to take a, a catastrophic event before we get our stuff together, uh, Bill? Or or do you see an opportunity? I mean, the Senate's obviously on top of this, right? They're 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 asking questions. They're bringing you up to testify. They're writing this report. Is there the possibility that we we get some sort of movement? And if so, 
in your ideal world, what does that movement look like? Is it is it, is it a bigger NCSC? Is it more authority? Is it more responsibility? Is it a change of the way the FBI or the CIA operates? What What's needed here? Uh, well, Jamil, there's two good questions there. Number one, yes, I, I believe it's going to take a big event, right? So as we see, and you referenced- well, I wish you were going to say no. No, it's going to take, because where is the pain threshold for all these breaches, right? Where, where, where do we feel the pain? You know, the, the companies, for the most part, they get breached, they have a small dip on their stock, they get back at it, right? So the ransomware is at its ungodly high, right? So my thing is, what I fear most is this coming winter, we have a massive electrical grid issue, gas and oil pipeline issue that we directly tie to a nation state threat actor, North Korea, Cuba, China, and that people don't have heat, people die, and it's a supply chain issue, it's a critical infrastructure issue, and it's also an economic issue, but it's a China issue, it's a Russia yeah. issue. To me, that's gonna be where the pain is because people will actually die and we're not prepared for that. Now, the FBI will come in afterwards and they'll investigate this thoroughly with what their law enforcement and their partners, as well as CISA will do the cyber part of it and the, the NERC and FERC, all those things will happen piecemeal because yeah. that's what they do greatly. But overarching, there's not one government organization that's going to be able to advise and inform to protect those things because we are America. Secondarily, I'll, I'll, I'll say to your last point, why should it take that type of pain and suffering for us to understand that our nation state threat actors like China are just as bad as a terrorist, right? I'm right. not sure why we have to get there, but I'm afraid. Let's look at the issue this past uh, week in North Carolina with the electrical substation being shot up, right? right. 45,000 people don't have electricity. It's in North Carolina. What if it was in San Francisco or New York City and you had a million Some people, people might be happy. Right. Just yeah. Die. So, you know, and then then you have massive looting and you have all kinds of chaos. People panic. Right. Wasn't that hard for people to do what they did? And, and if we end up tying it to a nation state threat actor, there's going to be really, really um, great cause for concern and people asking for this being an act of war. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Well, you know, we have a lot of questions now. Apparently, my 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 entreaty to folks put questions in the in the chat uh, room worked. We've got seven questions, so let me bring in some of the questions that actually relate to what we're talking about right now. Um, so, you know, Charles Gorder asks, you know, what recommendations do you have, Bill, uh, to improve the analysis of all of these different threads of intelligence that are coming in from various places? Right? How do we how do we connect the dots in this space? You met, you you drew the analogy to counterterrorism, and and the NCTC in a lot of ways was created to connect those dots. Can NCSC play that role? Has it played that whole role historically? And should it play that role going forward? And if so, what does it need to do that? Well, great. That was a great question. And I would say, yes, I think NCSC, you know, about due respect to the fact that I had that job, right? So scalability is the problem, right? So NCSC always served as that organization that had one foot in the intelligence community and was also able to drive that, that threat intelligence to the private sector effectively, right? So I think it has the capability to do that. But I think the yeah. key here is getting that intelligence collection out of the IC into the private sector is not as easy as it sounds, right? And I think there has to be a conduit. And again, look at CISA. I keep drawing connections to CISA. Yeah. CISA is a big, really important part of uh, DHS, but they're not part of the intelligence community. So they have to rely on INA and DHS mm -hmm. to provide them from classified information. So there is a gap here, so to speak, with getting yeah. real-time actual intelligence to the private sector more effectively and efficiently than we do now. So let's talk about that. Actually, Stephen Harris has a question about that. So it's a great point. I, I think we can all agree that it probably isn't happening as fast or as quick as it needs to, um, or as or as comprehensively as it needs to, right? So Stephen wants to know, you know, how how is is intelligence sharing where it should be? And the answer clearly is, I think, is your answer is no. How do we get it to where it needs to be? Like, what what do we need to do? Is it more clearances for the private sector? Is it more rapid declassification? Is it give somebody the job of connected us and then sharing it? it like, what, what? How can we? How can we move that ball today? If you were, if you could wave a magic wand, right, and money weren't an issue, which neither of which is true, um, how would you get uh, intelligence sharing where it needs to be? Well. Well, there's a whole litany of things, but I would start real quickly. Uh, authorities have to be expanded to allow that to happen from the intelligence community uh, more effectively yeah. and working with their partners. Two, I think there has to be a real clear dialogue with the private sector. And, and again, I guess mm -hmm. I would say the top 10 critical infrastructure sectors. What do you actually need from the government, right? There needs to be that conversation. Yeah. Not Instead of just throwing more noise at them, what do they actually need real-time 
collection to be able to protect what they build, ideate, and manufacture, right? So I think that has to happen more effectively. And I do think NCSE has the capability of doing that or an organization like NCSE who doesn't have a primary other mission to be in that counterintelligence space, right? There needs to be mm -hmm. that organization that's not recruiting spies, protecting from spies. Yeah. So you need a you need a separate independent agency, and you keep mentioning CISA. That's the new cyber uh, and infrastructure security agency that lives inside of DHS, but has some measure of independence. It's got this charter. It's got a budget, right? So it may not have the, quite the independence yet you'd want for a new this new sort of revitalized NCSC. Um, but CISA, at some level, is a model for what you're talking about. Yes, it is, and I think uh, when the Homeland Security uh, Committee in the, in the Congress made CISA very quickly, uh, it had all the right right intentions, and I think CISA has grown into uh, an amazing apparatus that does what they do very well. I think going back, they just need to be included some more authorities to be able to drive yeah. some of the things from a cyber policy and to cyber directives to be able to mm -hmm. uh, force folks to ha do things and reporting. So that, that'll that come. But I think, you know, keep in mind, this is pretty, pretty new here. But I do think they're on the right path. They just have to be added more authorities. And I think, but remember, I, I don't know this to be true, uh, Jamil, but I would proffer that the majority of what CISA does is in the nation state threat actor realm, right? Yeah. So is it really a cyber organization or could it really be jeweled as a counterintelligence apparatus with cyber being the modality for which it uh, operates in? And then you'd, you'd want another organization that operated across the other modalities? Is that is that, that the theory? No, I, have, I think we don't need to create any more organizations, right? I think yeah. that's uh, not what I'm, um, my, I would proffer. And like okay. I told the Senate, I think NCSC has the authorities already to do what we want to do. It's just the scalability and resource issue. Right. And I see, you know, when you look at NCSC versus NCTC, you know, NCTC's, I don't know, five, six times the size of NCSC. So yeah. at some point, as a government organization, we have to realize that the nation state threat is important and we have to reallocate some of those resources or at least make them commensurate with the threat. Yeah. You know, Eric Biles asked the question, you mentioned, you've now mentioned a couple of times NCTC and the important role that it plays, the National Counterterrorism Center. Um, Eric wants to know whether NCSC, your organization, uh, the National Counterintelligence Security Center, and how does it work with uh, NCTC? Do they work closely together? And given that their missions may overlap at critical places, right? How much overlap is there and, and what are the key differences between those two organizations? Uh, that's a great question, Eric. They, they overlap almost not a lot, right? So they, mm -hmm. there's very little. I mean, they are really germane. So their mission, obviously, to prevent terrorism, uh, I would say the last couple of years, they've really re out, refocused to the domestic threat, right? The, the lone wolf and then the, the homegrown violent extremist, uh, where NCSC is predominantly to protect the domestic landscape against China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, right? They are separate. Now, unless there right. is a country out there that has, you know, an aggressive terrorist organization with and utilized by the intelligence apparatus, we would overlap. But the employees, the analysts, the leadership work really closely every day in terms of the big picture protecting our homeland. Got it. Got it. Um all right, so Tom Palmer uh, is interested in knowing um, whether satellite warfare is relevant at all to this topic, um, and is sort of is there an overlap between the cyber threat that you see from nation states, the satellite threat? Is there is there some combination there, and and what's the relationship, if any, of all those things, satellite, cyber, to this counterintelligence issue that you've raised? Um, that's a great question, and and it was one of the points I was going to bring up uh, earlier. But when you look at what specifically what the Communist Party of China is doing, I would put yeah. their 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 threat aggressiveness in three buckets. The 5G, which is, you know, the whole Huawei issue. Currently now the crane issue from supply chain, the ZPMC cranes. Third would be space, right? Their, mm. their aggressive action in getting satellites at multiple orbits and getting licenses and patents for those places clearly drives a threat to not only Department of Defense, Space Force, NRO, NGA, and to facilitate not only their 5G in space, at the terrestrial level and in space, but also the movement of hypersonics around the globe. So I think that is a counterintelligence issue, right? Mm -hmm. Similar to what CFIUS is, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. protecting foreign inf investment in the U.S. Big picture, they're all countering foreign intelligence collection and promulgation around the U.S. So to me, they're all part of this apparatus and space is the currently new frontier we face, specifically when it comes to the Communist Party of China. Gotcha. That makes sense. Uh, well, great question, Tom. 
So one of our other attendees um, wants to wants to know more about the potential threat that we might have for this information change. We talked a lot about the need to share information, right? You know, this came up post 9-11 as well, right? Um, you know, not everybody trusts, uh, you know, our government, right? And we, as Americans, come from a background of, you know, we, we didn't trust the British government, right? And validly so, it's why we have those those amend, those first 10 amendments in the Constitution, right? The protections of our privacy and civil liberties. Um, and he's concerned about this sharing of information between, he or she is concerned about the sharing between intelligence and domestic law enforcement. Um, you know, should we be worried about um, about too much information sharing? And how much should we be worried about that internal, you mentioned the insider threat actor, right? What about the Chelsea Manning threat, right? Um, you know, when we have folks like that that might reveal classified information, sure, Edward Snowden, who was in there now, has now become a Russian citizen, a traitor that he is. Um, talk to us about how we should think about privacy and civil liberties. We're talking about more and more information sharing. Well, the, the whole... Um, dichotomy with respect to the, the gray space between privacy and civil liberties and security is one that will be talked about forever, right? And again, and I'm not going to uh, apologize for being on the government side of that. We need to overshare. And sometimes we need to sacrifice a little privacy for the protection, not only of our nation, but our systems, our data and our people, right? That just comes with it, right? So when you get your security clearance, you give up a lot of rights for that security clearance and you can become an insider threat or you go online, you do something nefarious on a government computer, you pay the penalty. Now we right. are not right. doing as good as we should be doing in that respect, but I also proffer to that the question that if you look at the last four years, some of the most destructive thefts of intellectual property and trade secrets came from the insider threat in the private sector. You could just go on DOJ's website and Google, right? From Harvard to MIT to General Electric to a million different companies that have lost their IP. And those companies have lost those business capabilities around the world. That insider threat was able to affect their nefarious activity because Sometimes they weren't being watched carefully enough by that company because of privacy and civil liberty issues. So it is a really, really difficult discussion that will go on for the next decade. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so uh, so the, another another one of our attendees um, is interested in knowing about this TikTok issue, right? Um, I mentioned it. Um, how do we balance this, this uh, potential interference, right, in private enterprise with TikTok, which is we could debate whether TikTok's a privately owned company or not. They claim to be a privately owned company in China, but we know how the Chinese government operates. Um, there is some discussion about, we've seen a lot of people, Mike Pompeo has tweeted about it, right? Uh, Tom Cotton has tweeted about it. We know the FBI director has raised the issue about TikTok and its collection of Americans' personal data, right? How concerned should we be about TikTok? What's the real threat? And should we be worried if we're monkeying around, even if it is a Chinese company, the, the private sector is sort of saying, hey, we're going to ban a private company from selling their goods um, in the United States? Uh, to me, TikTok is is, is current, relevant, relevant, and it's really important for a, a tech right now because, listen, there's no doubt that it's a it's a Communist Party of China company, right? Tencent, mm. um, ByteDance, those companies, you know, ByteDance who owns TikTok, is partnered with the Communist Party of China. So for them to say it's a private company is is just false. What do you do mean by think, that? When you say they're partnered with the government of China, what does that mean, like, realistically? So any so in 2017, China reinforced some of those laws that said, mm -hmm. if you are a company that is Chinese here in, in China or around the world, you are obligated to provide anything and anything we want from a data perspective. And it was very specific to not only the company, but the CISO, the CIO, the general mm -hmm. counsel. So that data flow from Alibaba, ByteDance, Tencent has always been proven to be a, a free flow of data to the Communist Party intelligence can I, apparatuses. But can I ask you a question about that? A lot of people say, a lot of people say, okay, yeah, I got that bill. I got it. The Chinese government taking all this data, right? But we have laws that require Google and Facebook to give information to American, you know, that require American companies to give information to the U.S. government. Isn't that the same thing? Or is there a fundamental difference because in one case, the Chinese Communist Party is judge and executioner. There's no limitation in the U.S. We have courts and oversight and Congress. And, I mean, is, is it the same thing or is there a fundamental difference uh, uh, in these operations? Great, great question, Jamil. And we could talk about this for four hours. It's not even close, right? So, you know, as, as Americans, we grew up in this country, like, we, clearly, there's a difference between the government, the private sector, and, and the criminal organizations. In China, they're all the same, right? So this, the, the Alibaba, Tencent, ByteDance, those people who are running those companies have brothers and sisters and aunts in the Politburo, in the Chinese government, right? So they work together. 
In the U.S., yes. Can the government ask via a court authorized document, a subpoena or search warrant for Jamil's records? Very specific. And yes, they can. And they will get very specific information that which was asked for through a court order, which means you have to have an agent or an officer go to a U.S. attorney and get it approved. And you go to a judge and get that signed. Yes, that happens all the time. But that's very specific law enforcement action. Not the case in China or in Russia or Iran, right, where you are obligated to provide that information. Back to TikTok, to me, the issue is, as much as I've been saying this online and members of the bipartisan efforts on the Hill, and I think the Biden administration has said, yeah, it's a problem, but no one's feeling that pain, mm. Jamil. No one's feeling the pain. My son's not allowed to have TikTok because I walked him through the process of right. why it's a problem and how we can go from his phone to my phone. We yeah. need to have an education campaign about why TikTok is a problem more than just talking points on the internet. Yeah. Well, you know, Bill, it's funny you talk about, about, about TikTok. My son's the same way. I've, told, I've made clear to him there's no there's no downloading TikTok. He knows, right? He's on top of it. But just the other day, you know, he, he made his Christmas list and he put a drone on it. It's a DJI drone. And I said, we've already talked about this. You know better. I mean, these drones have cameras on them. They're flying around all. I mean, this I mean, this is a real problem, too. It's not just TikTok, right? Right. So, Jamil, I think what you just said there, I think is going to go back to the germane point of this discussion. And it's going to sound corny, but the government really needs a robust sales and marketing team, right? That can talk about these issues to the American people, not only explain what the threat is, but why it matters. Why is Amazon Alexa, if you don't treat it right, why is it a problem in your home, right? What is what is the safety or lack of safety on Internet of Things with respect to China and Russia? I think NCSC or something like that can really build that apparatus and scalable, but the government needs to be more effective in doing these things and telling the American people what these real-time threats are that are germane to today with our society, yeah. our interests, because we're not doing that effectively. Yeah. Uh, so, so Bill, one of our, and we're, um, folks, we're down to the last eight minutes. So please, if you do have more questions, throw them in the chat uh, feature and we'll go and try and get some, as many of them as we can. So Tom Palmer asks, um, you know, you had mentioned the potential, you know, there's a potential to take down significant critical infrastructure systems. Um, if internet and cell service are disabled, Tom wants to know, can our defense agencies and the executive branch still communicate in a scenario where sort of the typical internet and cell service are down? Um, to some degree, I think I yes. step carefully. Yeah, I think I step yes, carefully. To here. some degree, yes. To some degree, no. And I'm not get too much into this and in classified. We've come a long way since 9 11. Uh, but, but more importantly, we'll just take the government and Defense Department away. My concern would be first responders, emergency services, state and local governments can they communicate and respond effectively if their communication systems are down or energy is down? That, that to me, if you look at what happens in a hurricane, or a massive tornado, and that is now caused by a nation th state threat actor, are we able to right. communicate and, and live in that space? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, one another one of our attendees asked a question about, you know, again, we're going back to this information sharing construct, right? Um, and, a, and a concern about information sharing is that some of these agencies, you know, the SEC, for example, has regulatory authority, and they might use information sharing uh, to bring regulatory proceedings. They might file lawsuits, private actors, if the information comes out, you know, the government has very broad FOIA obligations, right? Um, they might bring proceedings, either regulatory or litigation, against companies to challenge their disclosures or use that information against them. Right? Is there a worry about the adverse consequences to the American private sector that ultimately not only harms the companies, but also da damage the ability and the willingness of people to collaborate with the government? What about that? Is that a worry in this space? It is. Uh, Jamil, it's a great question. I, and I was part of these discussions you know, years ago, and we were, we were we started the conversation of, re, of re, mandatory reporting, right? So, and that can the SEC or regulatory component use that information against you? To me, it's an easy fix. You just put it in legislation that it can't be, right? It's just really simple, yeah. right? So to say, hey, if you were doing the right thing by notifying your regu regulatory agency or the FBI or CISA you've been breached, then you're going to be held, held harmless like, from regulatory action. It's a simple Or fix. litigation. Or litigation. It's it's four sentences in, in the legislation. That's an easy win for me. Yeah, no, that's a great point. You know, we spent a lot of time thinking about this on the cyber information sharing front back in 2010 when we wrote the first information sharing bill. And we provided that kind of liability protection. Unfortunately, between the negotiations between the Senate and the House, they, when they finalized that bill in 2015, some of that language got pulled out. And now, you know, you wonder why if, if there's if there's regulatory and liability exposure, right, and, 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 and potential litigation, right, every lawyer, you know, on this call is going to advise their client do as little as possible, wait as long as possible, not because you don't like the government, not because you're not trying to help the country, but if they're going to expose me to regulation or litigation, 
I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give you everything you want. I'm gonna give you as little as I have to, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it's all a bad, the law it's a bad business no more. decision. Yes, it's a bad business decision. Your general counsel will say to report if we're not protected, right? And to me, back to your 2010 analogy, lobbyists got involved, right? Because litigators have a lot of power, right? And they don't want to lose space in that in that compendium to be able to you know litigate. So to me. Legislation could happen very quickly with a paragraph saying you can be held harmless from regulatory action or litigation if you do the right things in reporting in a timely manner. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I tell you, the, the biggest opponents of regulatory liability protection for companies doing the right thing. And by the way, we had an exemption where you're where you're clearly you know doing something wrong, right? Um, uh, you know, knowingly, right? But the biggest opponents of that were the trial lawyers who wanted to bring massive litigation and you know make attorney's fees off of this stuff. So I totally hear you on that. So we've got one last question. Our last question is going to be from David Chu. David asked about the Colonial Pipeline case. And he says, look, in that case, um, the government was able to recover some of the rants that was paid, right? Is this a new capability? And would that be available to other folks who are who are affected by ransomware attacks? Well, David, good question. And, and part of my business, and when I'm out there telling clients, is that um, paying a ransom is a business decision, right? And now the ransom now is different than it was three years ago when you were going to get your power turned on or your systems back up. Now it's about data, right? The theft of your data, they'll give you your data back maybe if you pay the ransom. My only admonition would be if you're going to make a risk-based decision to pay the ransom, have the FBI right next to you when you do it. So they are probably running at a 50% clip of success rate of getting your money back. So if you're going to make the business decision to pay it, have the FBI there right next to you so they can track that money and hopefully get it back to you in the future. Awesome. Well, Bill, look, what a great conversation. Thank you for bringing this issue to our attention. Uh, really appreciate you spending the time with us. You know, uh, folks, Bill Avenida, uh, the, the head of the Avenida Group and the former director of the National Counterterrorism, uh, sorry, Counterintelligence Security Center. Uh, Bill, thanks for your service and thanks for all you do. My pleasure, Jamil. And thanks uh, for everyone that's been listening uh, as well as being on here and as well as uh, thanks for the Federal Society to be able to put this on, to have these conversations. It's a really good dialogue with not a lot of concrete answers, but awareness is the most important part of the cure. Jack, over to you. Thanks a lot, Jamil. Uh, well, with that, on behalf of the Federal Society, I want to thank both Bill and Jamil for the benefit of their valuable time and expertise today and for our audience for joining us as well. Uh, we always will be willing to hear listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. As always, keep an eye on our website for upcoming webinars. Later today at 3 Eastern, we have one um, on the Courthouse Steps oral arguments in the Moore v. Harper case in the Supreme Court. Um, and with that, thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned.